I wanted to share a, um, a collection of projects that are basically all trying to understand um, in different ways how much what we're calling capabilities. Um, capabilities meaning um, the you know kind of the mental health, the the behavioral kind of instincts, aspirations. Um, it's a, you know, a, collection, a collection of concepts that we mean when we say capabilities about how one is able to use the resources around one, both in terms of planning, fulfilling those plans. And this is affected by many things that are uh, you know, often intertwined with concepts within mental health. And you know, what we see is a lot, of, a lot of programs, and I'm going to be presenting several here, that are more economics-based programs that are trying to work with the world's forest to help them build sustainable sources of their own income. And to, in a very simplistic way, one of the things that is striking to us that we've seen, and I'll show you a few things about it, is that a lot of the, uh, you know, the, these programs that I'm going to share with you have a fair amount of success, but at the same time, it's not a success for all. Now, nothing ever works perfectly. Let's just be clear. That's a bit too high of an aspiration. So, but having said that, when we see the kind of separation that we feel like we're, we're observing in some of these studies, where some people really did really well with it and others less so, it makes us want to ask, well, what's going on that this, many, this much in resources is provided to a household and they're not able to grab these resources and, and, and prosper? And so that's kind of one of the underlying motivations uh, in this and, and it's kind of in the spirit of that, it's 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 part of what we're seeing is what I might refer to as graduation 2.0. The graduation being a set of programs I'm about to share with you with the 2.0, meaning the first iteration of the test was just testing does it work, found really good success, and the 2.0 is now figuring out like how can we do better? Okay, so that's the prelude. Um the basic premise behind a lot of these programs I'm about to share with you is, in some sense, it's a sim simple message that I think conveys a lot of the philosophy behind it. It does actually create some problems uh, between us here, um, which I'll explain in a second. But the basic premise starts with the idea and recognition that co the cause of poverty is complicated. Um, I'm always struck by anybody who thinks they can give a TED talk to explain the root cause of poverty. Um, anybody who thinks they can do that is, you know, to, uh, you know, makes me cringe. Um, but, you know, and the fact that it's so complicated is, uh, you know, and, and again, this is a somewhat simplistic way of, of concluding this, but it's probably why singular approaches have not done so great. And it, it's not to say none of them have had shown some success. In fact, cash transfers probably is like the single singular approach that has like the most positive evidence for a particular approach. But if you think about microcredit, if you think about training programs, a lot of these are singular approaches which have some modest impacts, but nothing that really takes somebody in, in like five years later, we tend to see like really large average impacts. And so the basic premise of a series of programs, which I'll start off with sharing, um, that or in the early days, we referred to as graduation programs, more broadly put them under the umbrella of what we call just a multifaceted social protection program. A little bit more of a mouthful than graduation, but graduation, um, you know, uh, um, is a, uh, it's kind of a weird phrase too, to be honest, but, and it has some old history to it that's not so interesting. So, but the basic premise is work on multiple things at once. That when you're working with a household, the kind of, the simplistic way of explaining it would be, you know, if a cat, if a household lacks information about how to how to raise pigs, but also lacks capital for how to that they need to buy some starter pigs, then if you just hand them capital, they they don't start a piggery because they don't know how to. They don't know the technical. And if you just tell them about how to start a piggery, but you don't give them the money to start it, they kind of look at you and go, "Well, that wasn't so helpful." I mean, can, can I have some pigs? Um, and so that's a very simple example but then uh, of what, what we mean by work on many problems at once. The problem with, and so uh, actually, so here's the kind of rough timeline, the way this program typically rolls out. And we have done a test now with Dole here in the Philippines. And we, um, the results are not in this presentation, but we find some really nice positive impact from the program. 
So the program typically starts now with that slide. That one. I'll look that um, with some market analysis and targeting, market analysis being to try to understand what likelihoods make sense to promote in this context, in this market for these people. And targeting is about targeting um, poor households. In some contexts, like with uh, like here in the Philippines, there's already a targeting process that's, that somebody else has already done, maybe a government cash transfer program. So a lot of cases, it's just it's just kind of piggybacking off of that targeting. But in other contexts, we've seen this done. Uh, it's a it's its own targeting system. And then at the very beginning of the program, there's basically five different components that are rolled out. Some somewhat a little bit sequenced, but for the most part, these are just kind of launched. Um, all in the early phases of the program. There's life skills coaching, which often takes place as in the context of a weekly or monthly visit from the um, nonprofit or the government that is rolling this out to the household, trying to help help them set plans. This is a little bit like the capabilities aspect, but not it's not too heavy, but this is basically what that is trying to do. And also it is information, right? It is like, hey, what are the problems you're facing with your pigs or your goats or whatever the case is? Um, there's consumption support. In the case of a program that is overlaying on an existing government program, a lot of times that's not, there's no like additional consumption support, but because they're already overlaying this on top of a cash transfer program that the government's already doing. There's um, uh, always a promotion of savings so that when they start generating income out of their income generating activity, they they are they have an easy, easy on-ramp to putting that money in a bank or an informal savings group. And there's the technical skills training on what whatever the likelihood is. And, and then the, the key, the kind of the biggest piece of it from a cost perspective is the asset transfer. And that's also a biggest piece of it in terms of participation. Usually when this program is done, you get something in the border of like 99 to 100% of people participating. And undoubtedly that's because there's a large answer. asset transfer of three to four, $500, so usually three to $400 of assets that are transferred. Um, there have been a few cases where people turned down the program. Um, but those are kind of unique situations that we actually did have it happen here in Dole, but that had to do with like the timing of the way it got rolled out. Um, in most places, it's about 100% participation. And like I said, I, th I think if the asset transfer were not part of it, you probably would not get 100% participation. Um, so, that, um, so the first order question is the simplistic, can it work? Um, the original test, we had eight sites of the original test. Uh, the Bangladesh is in red, that was done by some other researchers. Then. We put together the six that are in yellow into a paper in science um, that was published in 2015. Um, the Yemen site was originally supposed to be part of those six. It was supposed to be seven, um, but there, the civil war in Yemen prevented us from doing any measurement for four years. And so it was not part of that initial paper because we did, couldn't get the data. Uh, we did eventually get the data um, and that paper has been published separately. Happy to send, had send both of these to people. They're also both on my website. Um, the striking thing, and you know, a lot of times, um, and for those of you who have been involved in program evaluations, you probably have had this experience as well. Most of the times that I'm looking at results from a study where we have 10 things that we're measuring, we say, okay, this program we hope is going to, it's going to be microcredit, it's going to be a training program, and we hope it's going to increase business profits. We hope it's going to increase labor supply. We hope it's going to increase consumption. We hope it's going to increase food security, and then and then people are gonna save some of it, and then their physical health will get better, and their mental health will get better, and we measure 10 different things. And usually we face the problem that, you know, three, maybe four go up, and the others don't. And then we have to try to, you know, grapple with whether that's um, just because the results were weak on some, didn't exist. Um, obviously, when you have too many things you test, and you find like, you know, the kind of anonymous statistical challenges, if you test 20 things and one goes up, then, you, then you're very much subject to the idea that that's not a real result, that's just spurious. So this thing that was, you know, first time in my career that I'd experienced this, every single thing that we measured impact on, that the program was designed to try to move the needle on, went up. And I'd actually never had that happen where just everything went up. So we have per capita consumption went up. These are standard deviation movements. The two lines are at two years and three years. So the three years is really trying to get it at persistence and how, how long does it last? Um, per, up 0.12 standard deviations, household index went up, food security, amount borrowed, 
um, savings. Um, saving for what it's worth is a side story. Most of that is driven by one site that did the savings a little bit differently and, and really jacked up savings by a lot. The, the savings for the most was, was a bar that was about the same size as the other bars. Um, labor supply went up, um, physical health, mental health, and as well as even a political index. There was nothing about this that was trying to be political. The, by political here, what, what we're referring to is um, did you attend community meetings, things of this nature? Not like literally, not like super politics, but just community engagement and, and that went up. Um, and, and it was cost effective. These are the six sites. Um, it did not do well in Honduras. The assets that were transferred were mostly chickens and the chickens in year two got sick and, and a virus spread through them and died. And so it did cause harm to the whole program, which does point out that, you know, this is not like, you know, easy peasy run this program. The, the, the asset that is selected, the market needs to be thought carefully in terms of the, the risk um, that might be um, germane for it. Um, and, but here's one of the key ones that I mentioned in the very beginning. These are percentile um, results. And so striking thing here is at the upper end of the, of the distribution, we see these huge treatment effects, but at the low end, it's pretty flat, right? And so we, um, you, know, you know, what this tells us is that if, if everybody had the same exact treatment effect, if everybody was just 0.2 standard deviations better off, regardless of where they were in the distribution, then this would be a, a flat, a, a series of bars that were equal height. So this is what motivated, this slide here motivates a lot of the work that I'm now going to start sharing, which is on, on capabilities, where we moved into a second phase of this. Um, and, and so, and that's the focus of what I want to talk about now. Um, so there's two different parts of this, and I'm going to share with you some, uh, like I said, a collection from a few different studies that were part of that, that original six but that were kind of side studies to those six, but also some new studies that are now underway. Where we, um, one of them is actually coming out in Nature in like today's the 25th and I think on Thursday. So, um, um, and um, so we're pretty excited about that. And then, and then some others are still working, working papers. So the first question we wanna know is, is capital a sufficient constraint to relax? Right? And so one way of thinking about this is, does adding capabilities components affect outcome? Right? Um, and because we know that capital constraint, we, we know that capital is relaxable in a sense, right? We know that if we give someone money and they were constrained before on money and we give them some money that we can relax that constraint. So it doesn't say we satisfy all the needs they have, but we can relax that constraint. Um, what we wanna know is if it's a sufficient constraint to relax. And if it's sufficient, well, that tells us that the capabilities doesn't really matter, right? And, or we don't necessarily know that it's capabilities, but we just know that like, we don't need other things. Just doing the capital alone is good. A second question to ask is, are capabilities a sufficient constraint to relax, right? And there, that's also, we do need to also first ask the first order question, which is, are they relaxable? That's not something we know these easily, right? With money, we know we can relax that. We hand someone money. If we run a program to try to help someone build capabilities, improve mental health, improve their ability to take, take, make a plan and take action and fulfill that plan, will that work? Will that improve mental health? Will that help them make plans? That I don't know. So we need to also establish just that as a first stage. So um, part of this, and um, this is, I want to talk a little bit more, um, you know, methodological for just a moment, not about this program in particular, but just kind of partly explaining our thinking for how we're trying to organize some of these studies. Because, you know, I think about there is a kind of a sequence of learning. And we started off with a series of like that science paper, which had six sites plus Yemen, which basically established that something worked. So that's the weather. We did the random, we randomized it so that it helps us establish causality. And that establishes whether A causes B and by how much. A, B is, is the program. B is any one of those outcomes that we care about. We know that A caused B to move and we actually have an estimate of how much. So how do we learn why, right? Why did it work, right? And, and we ask this not merely 
you know, we are interested in this as academics, trying to understand more about why the world works as it works and social phenomena work. So there's a part of us which is kind of, uh, is kind of in that sense, curious as, as academics. Um, but for most of us, and I'm guessing this is true of everybody in this room as well, we're not sitting here because we're just curious people. We, we are curious people. It's how we chose this job or other roles that we could play. But we're probably also here because we just care about the problems in the world and we think of evidence and research as a path to making the world a better place. And so we don't just ask these questions because we're curious. We also ask them because they have very clear implications. If we know why something is working, they tell us something about how to do it. They tell us how to target it. Because if you know why something's working, that might actually give you insights about who it's going to work best for and who it's not going to work well for. Um, they might also give you implications for unmeasured aspects if you know something about the why. Things that maybe were a little bit beyond what you're able to survey for. But if you're interested in why it's working, it might give you some insights about some, some unmeasured aspects of a program. It's also important for implications for replication and extension, visibility, um, viability. So it worked in that context. Will it work somewhere else, a different country? Just put up these sites from around the world. Not a single one was the Philippines. But even within the Philippines, suppose we did it in Lausanne, found it work. Will it work in, in Mindanao, different context? Some of it is going to have some similarities. Some of it will translate, maybe other parts not. It could be things that are about the culture, but it also could just be about markets and access to markets and transaction costs, proximity to proximity to roads. There's a, a lot of different reasons why something might work better or not. Um, it's not always easy to know all those factors, but that's what we mean by asking this why question. And then also the implications for modification and improvement. If we know why something worked, not only does it tell us in a sense, like, oh, you know, target these people, but not those people. But then for the people you're not targeting, you might want to say, well, but they were poor. It's not that we're not targeting them because they weren't poor. We're not, we're not targeting them because once we understood more about the why of the program, we realized it's not good for them. Well, what is, what is right for them? And how can you modify the program to maybe, maybe work there? So how do we ask why is different. And here there's a few different paths. Um, that I and I kind of divide these things up in my head to so these these different these different tools that are within our toolkit that are a little bit you know more nuanced than just randomizing, which is what we do to get at the weather, whether it worked. So the first is through data. Qualitative data can really help a lot in many contexts. Um, we have a project in Bolivia as an example that we did where we rolled out a commitment savings product in the Amazon area very very remote like you had to take a canoe to, uh, to for eight hours to get to this area of the amazon where where you have communities that are really separated from markets they're they're they literally have to get in a canoe and, 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 and row for a couple hours just to get to something that you would call a village um so they're very on pocket societies rolled out this commitment savings um, and the idea that in collaboration with the anthropologists that we we're working with who had been working there for decades was that this commitment savings would help people save up for tools to improve their yields and their farm and, and cookware and things of this nature. Turns out they saved up for alcohol. Like bottled alcohol you could buy, like, like, like that back there. <laughs> um, and, um, and we were surprised. Um, blood pressure went up too for men. It was mostly the men who did it. And so we went back and did a lot of qualitative work afterwards to share some of these results back with communities, try to learn. And the qualitative work really helped us understand more about the why. So that's one process. A second is more process and short run data. Um, and that helps get at sometimes the sequencing when you can see the sequencing in which changes take place through process data. You might not necessarily have that next to a counterfactual, but let me just, you know, a very simple example would be knowing participation rates. If you know, if you if you have a program that doesn't work, this is going to sound really stupid, but it's a, just a fully a good example of what I mean by this. If you have a program that you got a null result, the first thing you want to know is did people participate, right? If they didn't participate much, well, that explains your null result, and that helps you understand the why. Now you want to know why didn't they participate, which is a great second question, but at least you get the first order one, which is you're getting a, a null because they didn't participate, um, and so. Process data like that can help shed insight into what's going on. And if there's different components to your program, 
and you want to know why the program worked, well, knowing how they participated in the different components can maybe give you some insight as well. If there were some components that there was very low participation rates, well, you probably know it wasn't because of that component. Um, also, long run data can go a long way to, um, to help. So I'll share some results in that spirit. A second way is to randomize treatment arms. Right? This is um, a lot of times when we do studies, we do more nuanced studies. Take, take my example earlier about the piggery and the information in the capital. Like you want to understand something about the why there, the obvious thing to do is have three treatment arms. Some people get the pigs, some people get information about pigs, and other people get both. Boom, there you go. But that required knowing up front, this is our exact research question, and we can design the experiment around that. A lot of times you don't know what that's going to be, and you only learn that after the process. And then and the last is testing for sources of heterogeneity. Uh, sometimes this is across participants, sometimes it's across program sites. But a lot of times the why, for instance, would be if you want to, if you do an information program, and one theory as to why a program that provides information works is that people lacked information. Makes sense. But there's other reasons why an information program could work. It also could just be a signal to people that this is a good idea. Maybe they knew all the information beforehand, but now they trust the information more. So they kind of knew the answers. They would have gotten them right if you'd asked them, but they just didn't believe it. They didn't act on it, they didn't, right? And so that's a very different story. So if you know something about what information they had prior to your study, then you can look and see whether your treatment effect is bigger on the people who have more information versus less information. If it's no different, it tells you it worked, but not because it was informative, even though it was providing information, something else was going on. Um, and, and so, um, um, you know, as, as any, you know, I'll give you an example of something like that is that we have a project in Ghana where we're providing agricultural advice to, to farmers. And the striking thing there is that, um, the, when we ask, when we give them a battery of questions, like a test, basically in a survey, we have a pre and a post. Um, we ask them about 10 different questions that are technical questions about optimal um, about optimal farming technique. As a result of our extension work, we basically see no meaningful change in their knowledge, none whatsoever. For what it's worth, it was a really weird result that struck her as a, as a side note, since you're all you know, kind of in the space of evaluation um, in this kind of research. It was actually a statistically significant, but not all that. It was kind of a weird, uh, it, it, was, it was just so precisely estimated that it was statistically significant, but when you think about the magnitude of it, you're like, that's nothing. It was like we we were it was a statistically significant shift in getting from an average of like 72 to 73 percent. Okay. Now that's just not meaningful. Like to go from an average of 7.2 questions right out of 10 to an average of 7.3. So we conclude from that that there was no learning, even though that actually was statistically significant. Um, but practice has changed. So no knowledge went up. There was teaching people to do things. No knowledge changed. Um, but they were more likely to take action on that knowledge. Right? And so that helps us understand something about the why, that it's not so much about the knowledge per se, but about the willingness to act on that knowledge that changed from the extension. And that, that as we see it, is a useful insight. Okay, that was my methodological aside. I hope that was helpful or useful to think through. Um, so back to our back to these studies. Our asset is sufficient. So in this study, the reason there's a picture of a goat there is because we gave away goats. Um, we did this on the side of this study that I already mentioned with with graduation. We had extra treatment arms also, and one of them was just transferring goats to people. Nothing more. Um, and so here, what we have is um, the GUP. GUP stands for Graduating Out of Ultra Poverty, which is the name of the graduation program, the multifaceted multi program. So this is one of the six sites from that science paper that I mentioned. And, um, and the thing that's most important to notice here is that what I want you to focus on is the final column, the asset only, that's just handing them goats. So the blue and the orange are the two different versions of the graduation program with and without a savings component. So this is where we always see these nice, pretty big positive treatment effects. 
But when we just transfer people assets, which is the, 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 fourth, the fourth bar, zero across everything. But here's kind of an interesting thing. So this now shows you the full graduation program is the blue bar, and the orange bar is the, the go drop. We we'll refer to it as the go drop, uh, uh, which is a joke that works in America, but probably but nowhere else it seems. <laughs> um, and um, so, and here's the striking thing that we found, which is the value of goats. Uh, this is um, either two or three years after the goats were transferred. I can't remember which, but it's the same basic result, whether it was two or three years. And you notice that we do see a big impact on the quantity of goats that they have. So we gave out goats two to three years later. They got more goats. Remember, nothing else, nothing's changing in their life, realistically. Consumption's the same, asset value's the same, income's the same, food security's the same, financial security, everything else, everything's the same that we actually care about. Yeah. Um, it was done in pairs, and in, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they did, they were hip to the whole uh, fornication thing. Um, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I can't, you're making me wonder that could they have done something as silly as not done that, but I don't think so. I mean, that was like, they do, they are, they, they did, they did take, you know, second grade biology. <laughs> um, so, um, so then, so the goats go up, so they, they do keep the goats and they, and they rear them. But notice the second column, livestock value excluding goats goes down. Right, so the net net total livestock, no bad. So one way of interpreting this, there's a few ways you can interpret it, to be clear. But one way that we look at this, I think of this is this is this might be capabilities. The program didn't do anything at all to try to help the household say, add this to what you're doing. Don't replace other things, just add this and do more. Right? And the idea of taking on more things was not something that they were comfortable doing. So they took on the goats and sold off some sheep or sold off some other things. Um, the program might have been successful, just to be clear. Like when, when we see this, you might say, oh, that means it didn't work at all. No, that, do not conclude that because we have no measure of how much they ate over those two years. Right? This is at the end of two years or three years that we see that. So they might have, it might have been a perfectly good program as, a ca as the equivalent of a cash transfer, but done in the form of goats, where they're better off. They ate some goats. They ate better. Things were good for them. It's just that at the end of two years, nothing, nothing continued to persist. So the next question is, are assets necessary? And by the way, please do stop me too. I mean, you're welcome to ask more. And like, if anybody else has questions, please don't, don't be shy. <laughs> uh, totally, totally welcome. Um, just you know. so the next one I want to ask is, are are they necessary? How much action can we generate without including that asset? Now, remember, I mentioned earlier we get like 100% participation rates. Here we actually do have um, super high, I, I think 100% as well, participation rates without the asset. But I have seen some other cases where you drop the asset and then you see some what lower. So in this case, this is in Uganda. We're working in a refugee context. So it's a bit, that has a bit of a different aspect as well. These are refugees from the Congo um, living in Western, Western Uganda. Now the way it works with uh, the refugee communities in Uganda is there's always host communities that are right next to where the refugee area is. And so all programs in refugee areas always have like a pairing to them where you also provide similar services in the host area. And that's done partly for kind of obvious political um, fairness sense of, you know, making sure that the host communities don't resent the refugees for getting all these things and stuff like this. Um, but, you know, it, we end up we're, we're evaluating, we end up evaluating both. We actually find very few differences in impact across the two continents. So in this, I'm not going to present all the nitty gritty. So I want to just focus on the livelihood. I mean, I'm sorry, the capabilities aspects. But we have three treatments and a control. The first is a full program with individual coaching. A second is a full program, but with group coaching. So that coaching is about that information and the capabilities building. Um, and the difference here, there's you know, good reason, and this was actually tested here with Dolly as well, this idea of individual and group coaching. You could easily imagine a pro and a con both ways. Uh, on one hand, individual coaching, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's I'm meeting with Pratap. Pratap can, you know, um, get some more attention from me in that coaching. Um, and maybe he also was willing to share things with me that he's not willing to share in a group. And so I'm able to help in that way. 
Um, but the group aspect, you know, maybe Pratap comes to the group meeting and shares and Nash has had a similar problem. And so I, as the coach, am able to actually say, well, what did you do Nash? And then Nash shares and that helps Pratap more and it helps even more than it would happen if Pratap just said, turned to me and said, what do you think I should do? Or, and I, you know, and that's actually helps more. Um, no, it is cheaper to do group. So there's a very practical reason why, from a program perspective, group works um, better. And that was actually one of the motivations in, with the Dole study that we did here was because you just you can reach more people and hold those meetings, and you know all twenty are there, thirty are there. You hold the meeting, boom, you you just your, your throughput in terms of how many people can be in a program per employee goes much higher. And, and that is one of the main constraints that I've seen time and time again working with government uh, is that when you say, great, this thing worked, we did it in 300 villages, and the government says, great, we have, we have 30,000 villages, and so that would need a team of 1,000 employees to run this program, and we don't have 1,000 employees that are trained and able to run this kind of program. So how do we do that? And, and the group group approach is one of the one of the ideas behind that. Okay, so that's the two. The, the third one, and this is the focus on what I'm going to focus on here, is the individual coaching, but with no asset. So it's basically treatment one, but no assets. And the question is, if you do everything but transfer the goats or the equivalent of the goats, how much action can you get? And the answer is, you can, you can get a decent amount of action but it's not as thick. So the, the answers to what's optimal is going to come out to, you know, something that's going to be very nuanced about the ratios because it's cheaper, right? So one thing to notice is that we see no difference between T1 and T2, the individual group coaching. So that if that's right and that persists, then T2 wins because T2 is cheaper. Okay. But the difference between T2 and T3 is less obvious. As you can see, the point estimates on productive asset value, promoted livelihoods, food security are all, um, you know, all positive for T3, but not as big. And so the obvious answer to what's optimal is going to be partly about what the differential cost rate is and the cost ratios. Um, so that, you know, with a million dollars, $10 million, whatever the budget is of the government of the program, um, you know, the question is how can they optimize in that way? But one of the things that's striking about P3 is it shows you that this was a program which was really basically providing information, access to savings with informal savings groups, and a big push on capabilities. And it actually increased economic outcomes without any economic, like any sellable asset being transferred, so to speak, right? It was all information and training, and yet did generate these kinds of inputs. So that's a promising result. Um, similarly, attached to this, uh, the Ghana site of the six, we actually set up a, um, a bag making operation. We made 115,579 of these um, Ghanaian bags. Um, there's one of them that's actually, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to say, is part of the Nobel Museum in Stockholm because when um, Abhijit Banerjee won the Nobel Prize in 2019, the museum there, um, basically all the Nobel laureates are asked to donate some, something, some, some, some physical thing that is symbolic of their research in some, some way um, for a little exhibit in the museum to each of the Lords. So um, he, he donated one of these bags. Uh, so, um, so in this project, basically by setting up a bag making operation, what we were trying to do is have a good measure of labor productivity. One that we can measure directly by asking people to make bags, paying them to do them and seeing how well they do with them. And then we can see that this basically becomes an outcome measure of the program. So we ran the program, treatment and control, it was this graduation program, but then as an outcome, we look at bag productivity. And oops, I'm sorry, I don't have, I didn't put up charts for that. But what do we find? When you have that graduation program, you work more on the bags, more hours. And keep in mind that the graduation program actually does take up time, but yet even with that, they still work even more on bags. They put out more effort per hour, and they were more capable of completing complex bags. We randomized whether they were kind of easy or hard to make. One of the most important results, which is not germane to what I'm talking about here, but I'm going to mention it anyhow, is that there was no negative income effect. This is one of the big issues that a lot of programs, whether it's a cash transfer or any sort of any sort of social protection program, always kind of you know is is raised. It's oh, 
But if you transfer money to low income households, you just in, you know, disincentivize work. Um, and we find the exact opposite. And, and quite frankly, we're finding this very consistently across lots of contexts. That, that that is like one of the worst things, in my opinion, that we ever did as economists is teach this in economics 101, that there's this labor leisure trade off and income effects mean that you, lay, you produce more leisure and less labor. And it's like right out of economics 101. And it's just a really horrible, horrible thing that we've implanted on anybody who took econ 101 and nothing more because the data just don't actually support that that's actually happening at this level. I don't doubt that there's some level at which that's true, but that's just not anything that bears truth in low-income households that I've seen. Yeah. We find the opposite. Overall labor supply increases, increased. And this is true in other contexts too that we've seen. We have a we have a COVID cash transfer study in Ghana. We're finding the same thing. Transfer cash for people, labor supply went up. I, ironically, you kind of they wanted it to go down. That's something. It was a cash transfer to deal with COVID. So um, I think we're seeing the same thing in a proof study too. The cash transfers led to more work. Okay. Um, last, and then I think the last one. In here is a is a this is the study that I was referring to that is coming out in a couple days in in Nature, in Niger. This was built on top of existing cash transfer programs. So the government in Niger was already already had had a program providing cash transfers. They already did the targeting to find low income households and to providing them um, either weekly or monthly cash transfers for the sake of food food security. This program was also implemented by government, which was important uh, for the kind of move for this kind of space because to get you know it's interesting to see the effectiveness with nonprofits working at you know at, at kind of deep penetration but still somewhat smaller scale not hitting a country as a whole and then trying to see like okay how well can we make this work under under a government implementation um, we're finding that it's cost effective after eight, only 18 months and so as long as the benefits persist after that it's going to do really really well um, the, the basic program has here, this is where we really amplified the capabilities part. Um, the psychosocial components, it was not just the, the household visits that I mentioned before. There was actually a video that was, that was produced, that was shared in these community meetings that took place that were specifically about building role models and helping to increase hope and aspiration for households. Um, and then along with that was a life skills training. Um, and so here we have three different treatment arms, a capital package that was basically like the core, that was the closest to what I've been sharing with you before, the capital package. Then there's the psychosocial package, which did not include the cash grants, no lump sum cash grant, not no $300, here's the cash to go buy the goats or the pigs and things like that. But it did include the psychosocial, the, the, amp, the amplified psychosocial. And then there's the full package, which includes both the cash grants and the segments. So again, just to repeat, the capital package is closest to what I've been showing you from other sites, because it was it included the lump sum cash grants and not the amplified psychosocial aspect. And the full is um, is now the full package, but it's actually more than 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 a lot of the other countries have done so far. This is also part of a four country site, although we just have the Niger study in health yet. That's a map of Niger. That's another map. Oh, I That's good news. So here's the here are the, um, some of the uh, just a few of the key results. So on mental health, we are seeing um, the um, the control is is basically zero. I'm sorry, that's not very clear the way that's done. So the, because these are all treatment effects, so the control is, is shouldn't really be on that index. Apologies, um, and everything else is relative to control. So the capital. Um, is producing a 0.15 standard deviation increase in, in, in mental health. Remember, that one did not actually have a big component that was deliberately trying to target mental health because it doesn't have that psychosocial component. When the, you do the psychosocial without the capital, then we're at a 0.2 standard deviation improvement in mental health. And when you do everything together, then we're up to 0.25 standard deviation improvement. Um, and we see the same exact pattern for other measures uh, that are about capabilities and mental health, self-efficacy, and future expectations. Same exact pattern of the three. 
Um, we look at consumption and business revenue. We don't see quite that same um, um, pattern as start, but it is there. I realize one thing that is confusing is um, we change. I changed the order of the bars on here just to keep you keep you looking at the index. Um, it had nothing to do with me being lazy and not improving my slides. Um, this was the change that I told you I, I, I knew it was not going to be something I could do on the fly on this morning. <laughs> um, so here, the blue is the full. That was the one that was the fourth bar before. And so that is having the biggest effect on gross consumption, food security, business revenue. It's not quite as stark as we saw on the last slide, but we do see the same basic pattern where that is the one that is working the best. Um, and then the capital and, and, and social are tend to be somewhat tied. Although, as you can see with business revenue, the capital does do better. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, as we, one of the things that's striking here is for what it's worth, when you look at gross consumption as the key outcome, the blue bar is highest, but it's also most expensive. So the yellow bar, the social bar is actually the winner. From this, if, if you think of consumption as the most important outcome, as the, the best proxy at the end of the day that aggregates up all the various things, um, then because that one's also um, about 65 to 70% the cost, I forget the exact percent, but it's it's enough of a drop in the cost because of, it doesn't have the capital grant, then it actually wins from a cost effectiveness perspective. Having said that, it takes longer to achieve the impact. When we look at the six month impacts, Right? It's much further back. By 18 months, it catches up. So it takes longer to get there. So it's a little bit of needing to put on like a social welfare hat about what exactly you're optimizing. If you're trying to optimize 18 months and onward, then social wins. Depending on how much weight you put on those six months, 12 months, you might flip. Uh, what's encouraging is that they're all working. Okay, and then last. Last is the newest. Um, and here's in Ghana, we're expanding the, we're, we're kind of ex taking the initial study that we did and we're now working with a different partner, but doing a continued uh, graduation program in Ghana. And here, one of the key things is that we, again, we amplify here at the, the capabilities by running a cognitive behavioral therapy program prior to the graduation program. So this is different than the Niger, where Niger was simultaneous and built in. This one is sequenced. Let's do the cognitive behavior therapy first, and then let's run graduation. So what I'm about to share with you with the data that we collected in that in-between moment, we don't, um, not the, not the, at the end of the graduation. And so here we have, whoops, that's weird. A map of Ghana, I'll skip that, sorry. Why is this not? Okay. Oh no, now it's like, Do you have control? Can you go back one? Yeah, go. No, no, no. Go back to the prior slide. Just one, uh, no, one more. One more. No, one more. There we go. Okay. So one thing, one thing that's to know is that for men, nope, too far. Nope, too far. Go forward now. Nope, forward. Well, let me, I can talk to this while we get there. No, no, you want the wrong way. Go forward. Um, I just want to you know, you get to the slide. It says transition matrix. So, um, so what I'm going to share with you is the results that are just on the cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of the things that was, um, that we, that we saw that surprised us was that this was a program that was motivated because in, in some other panel data that we have, we saw that the rates of depression were really high in rural areas and like around 50 percent um, very you know this surprised us these are higher than we've seen elsewhere um and and meanwhile we met a psychologist um um who angela who's who's one of the one of the co-authors with us on this work who was adapting a cognitive behavioral therapy program that had been tested elsewhere and had adapted it to ghana to be done in groups in rural areas. And 
So we worked with her to incorporate that into what we were doing, randomizing the promotion that program prior to the graduating program. The thing that I'm about to share with you that was striking is that the program was really effective for, check, um, for improving depression rates, irrespective of whether someone was depressed at baseline. And one of the things that was striking is the first thing to notice is that the transition in and out of depression was really high. So it was a really high rate, but when we just look at the likelihood that you're, this is just in the control groups, so no one here got CBT. And as you can see from this, there's just a lot of movement in and out of, of, of being labeled depressed. Yeah. Why is there what? I have no idea. I, it's a great question, but I don't know. Um, but, you know, so that's, you know, that's it. And, and, you know, and to be fair, I can't actually, you know, you could argue that too, that there was a question about measurements and, you know, anytime that is measured, it's going to be um, subject to, um, you know, potential biases, just the way the questions are asked and surveys down the screen and things like this. So, you know, I'm very hesitant to make a comparative statement across places. What, what we were just motivated by is given what we did observe, it was, let me be clear, it was already on our mind to do psychosocial programs. It wasn't like this idea came out of nowhere, but when we saw that rate, it, it did strike us like this had a you know, potential promise. Um, it's not that the area has more poverty than anywhere else that we're dealing with and things like that. So I don't know, it's not like we can say like, oh, these people were poor in the continent. Um, but we do see this movement in and out, as you can see by the shades. Um, you know, the share above um, worsened mental health, 31%. 31% improved mental health and 38% um, at the state of the same, you know, at the diagonal, right? And so that alone is, is a striking fact of how much movement there is in and out. And we think that's part of why we're seeing a strong treatment effect in this program, irrespective of your baseline status, that it basically was effective for helping people who were depressed become less depressed, but it was also effective at helping people who were not identified as depressed to stay not depressed. So you want me to try to do it or do you want to control? Okay. So these are just the um, the outcomes at three months from mental health index. We saw it go up by 0.15 certain deviations and self-efficacy up to 0.3. We didn't have that many outcomes on, on, on um, economic outcomes and physical health. We did have a few and projected economic status um, went up tremendously for what they basically saw them, their you know, in a kind of very subjective qualitative question, like on a scale of one to 10, you know, project how, what you think your economic status will be in five years. And that went up considerably. Um, we also see labor supply go up um, from reporting being healthier. And we see self-reported health go up. Go ahead. Um, I think the slide now just says everything I just said. Just go, you, I think you have to hit a few times, yeah. So, oh, no, go back up. One more. There we go. So, you know, the striking thing is that we see that it works. And we also see that it does permeate to some other issues, other outcomes that were not directly part of CPT. We see improved cognition. Um, that one actually really surprised us. Um, this one was measured a couple of different ways, and both went up. One of the ways is to do a digit span test where you rattle off 10 digits to someone and you say, please repeat those back for us. And actually made people more able to do that. Um, improved perceived physical health, improved economic activities. And like I said, one of the key results, because we see is that we saw this impact for everybody, not just those identified as depressed. Um, so, um, so then, you know, basically, you know, Putting this all together, where do I, where do I, where do we see this going? And we are very keen to do, you know, we're very keen to do research on this topic here in the Philippines as well. Um, I know it's been a while, but my, I think my last trip here, maybe it was penultimate, but it was back in 2019, 2018. We were, we were actively trying to look for groups that do cognitive behavioral therapy here in the Philippines to try to see about incorporating, um, doing some research on that topic as well here. If anybody knows of such uh, groups or opportunities, I'd love to talk. Um, so, what, you know, what are the basic takeaways to, that I have from what I've shared with you? Obviously, it's a, you know, these are all little piecemeals of, of projects. 
Um, but one takeaway is that capabilities are movable. This is not something that is just a given about fixed characteristics that somebody has, and, and we just have to accept it and try to work around it. That these aren't things that, that there are programs and methods to try to help improve people's capabilities. Um, that they're important, they can make big impacts, and that they're important for all. That when we're, when we're able to move it, we're seeing it across the board. Um, whether they interact with treatments, to be determined. We don't know yet on that. You know, the, what I mean by that is, like, do we see the, if we do a cognitive behavioral therapy and we do a, a cash or some sort of economic program, and each one has a treatment effect of 0.1, does that mean that the two together, we get a 0.2? 0.15, do they kind of, are they alternate paths to the same goal, but they don't actually add to each other, they just kind of provide complementary ways to get to the same goal, or does it go the other way and it gets a 0.3 that, um, that they, so. Um, a, a, second, a second point that I want to leave you with, and it's part of one of the reasons why I like sharing this kind of collection of things, is that um, you know, no one study is the end all holy grail of research, right? Um, we do a study, we learn from something from it, it adds to, I think of research is like a mosaic painting where we just added a little pebble and we have a little bit more of an understanding of the world. Um, anybody who takes one study and says, great, I learned so much from that, we can now just get rid of all future learning and just start policy, you know, that's just not, that's just not realistic, right? Um, and so instead, what we need to do is share, replicate, iterate, share, et cetera, as we learn more and more. Um, data quality, I know this was not part of what I talked about, but I, it's so important to what we do at IPA and, and also at GPRO, which is the Global Poverty Research Lab. I mentioned in Northwestern, we, we put a lot of effort and we're st we've started an initiative on methods issues, specifically about data quality, sampling methods, things, things of this nature, which um, to be perfectly blunt, get under, I think, underinvested in, and I say, I certainly say this within economics, where um, a lot of times we're very focused on other aspects of the research process, and we need to spend more time talking about data quality issues. Um, back to policy, one of the things that, you know, basically our takeaway on these programs is that they're expensive, but they're improving, and, and we're learning more and more about how to make them more cost effective. But the, the evidence so far does seem to show that they, in the long run, the benefits do increase, I mean, sorry, do exceed the costs. And so they have a very strong positive policy implication for, for government programs and for nonprofits as well. Um, but they do remain to be expensive, right? And so we do need, you know, we're continuing to do more work to try to figure out how to bring costs down. Um, as an example, the video that was used in Nigeria might be a path to implementing that kind of program at scale with, with lower cost because of the replicability of a video. Um, and, and so, you know, same basic idea um, can be done anywhere if you have the right video. Of course, the wrong video could be disastrous. So, um, and, and, and videos take a long time to produce, produce well, et cetera. So it can be a, 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 tricky, a tricky path forward but one that I think does have promise for um, trying to improve some of these aspects at, at cost, at, at, you know, in more cost-effective ways. Um, I think that was the right? Last one. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody.